Hi, it's Dennis Daly. I was saddened tonight to hear that Janet Waldo died. She was 96. Before her death, there were only three voices left from the golden days of cartoons. Janet, June Foray, Rocky the Flying Squirrel, who's 98, and my good friend Jimmy Weldon, who's 93, who was on the Yogi Bear Show. I feel very fortunate, though, that I was able to conduct one of the last interviews with Janet Waldo before it became too late to talk to her. So here now, from the archives, and just a couple of years ago, is my chat with Janet Waldo. I had told her at the offset that my two favorite interviews I ever did was a previous one I had done 20 years ago with Janet and one with Carol Channing. Wow, very honored. I love Carol Channing. Were you as energetic as a child as you became as an adult? Well, I've been told that I was. I had great energy, and I had a magnificent, both parents, but my mother, she was a fantastic singer in her youth, and she had dreams of theatrical dreams and everything. So she sensed that I was interested in drama, which I certainly was, because I would, a poem I would like to recite or I would remember it immediately. And so she sort of encouraged me. And she had friends who had been in theater and uh, she would send me to their houses and and they would work with me on a weekend, you know, when I was like five years old. Hmm. And teach me things like he beats his fists against the posts and still insists he sees the ghosts. He you know, beats his fists against the post and still insists he is a ghost? No, he sees that. He beats his fists against the posts, plural, and still insists he sees the ghosts. He sees the ghosts. Uh-huh. Well, you know, that's like Moses' sheep. It's one of those phrases such as duct tape. You know, oh, it, yeah. it's, <laughs> that's a purposely wonderful tongue twister. I love that. Oh, and, and I remember she taught me, this lady, a canner, exceedingly canny, once wisely remarked to his granny, a canner can can anything that he can, but a canner can't can a can, can he? I love that. Isn't that cute? <laughs> she taught me that, and I thought I was delighted as a child. You know, oh, certainly, Oh, yes. that's wonderful, you know, and, and, I, and I remember all of those things. Well, you know, so many of the people I've interviewed who ended up particularly to be singers were lucky in that they grew up in a musical home. You were around that theatrical, artistic thing early on. I was because my parents loved theater and my mother was a beautiful singer, but my father was a musician denied. He was a railroad man. He was a telegrapher. And I remember as a little girl, he... um, played the cello, and he would his, his job was from 4 in the afternoon until 12 midnight. And he would come home at midnight and play the cello. And I have memories as a little girl of hearing my daddy playing the cello at midnight. And then my sister, Elizabeth Waldo, who is quite famous, she toured with Leopold Stokowski's Youth Orchestra. She started me in radio because, she, first of all, she insisted because she was much more ambitious than I was and older. So when Bing Crosby, with his entourage, came to Washington, he was a graduate of Gonzaga University. He was coming to a homecoming. Where, where was all of this happening? Because you grew up in Washington State, right? Uh-huh. Now, where, where then would you have crossed paths with Bing? In Seattle, Washington. I was doing a little theater in Seattle. I was doing Beth and Little Women. Now, how old would you have been at this time? I was 15. Okay. And he uh, and his entourage from Paramount Studios, uh, they saw that theater production. After many different auditions, I was, you know, in the semifinals and the finals and the semi, semi, semifinals, I, uh, I won it. The prize was a three months contract at Paramount Studios. My goodness. Paramount Pictures. Then they brought my mother and me to Paramount to Hollywood. And I remember the neighbor lady said, oh, you're not going to take that child to that wicked city. And my mother was very worried. She thought, am I doing the wrong thing? Is this bad? Is this bad? But I won the contest, and I was under contract, actually scheduled to be under contract for three months, but I was under contract for two years. But you know what? I didn't like it. I didn't like pictures because I was, it was, I was under a stock contract where there were all, you know, girls who were nothing but gorgeous. They had never had any experience in acting. And I, of course, dreamed of going to New York and being on 
on Broadway. You didn't want to be just a pretty face. No. Yeah. And I was intimidated because they were so gorgeous. But I, they had a school on the, at uh, Paramount. And they had a, you know, had us doing scenes and everything. And because of my little theater experience, I got all the parts. <laughs> and the girls who were so beautiful <laughs> just stood around and were looked at. I remember Larry Crosby, who was Bing's brother, and uh, they he had an agency, the Everett Crosby Agency, and they became automatically my agents. And they said. Well, we don't know what we could do with you. You don't have any character in your face. You don't have any lines. You don't have what you know. You don't. There's nothing to see. But you can act. <laughs> yeah. That that that. I remember you you telling me before, and I want to get into this. That there's the temptation to think of people such as you or Dawes Butler, or Mel Blanc, as doing funny voices. But if you couldn't act in that character, it wouldn't work. And Mel Blanc said, "I don't do voices. I do people." And mm. I always loved that because in doing so many cartoons as I have done and do do, I I like to think of them as people. I, I very often the people who do just voices uh, don't know how to act. Yes, <laughs> but I don't mean to put down anybody no, no, no. in voiceover. Voice actors think that all you have to do is is imitations, but that isn't true. No, no. So so you 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 really get lucky. Your sister pushes you to do a, a, a talent search show. You're seen by Bing Crosby. You're brought to Los Angeles. You spend two years with Paramount, but you don't like it. I was terrified because I was terrified of the camera, you know, because I just I just thought, oh, you have to look so good, and it limited me as as an actress. So I was so thrilled when my contract was dropped. I wasn't really thrilled. You're the only because, person I know who was glad to get out of a Hollywood well, contract. Well, it was you know I was I was. We, my family, one by one, were moving to California, and it was a financial thing. I was getting fifty dollars a week, and uh, which was pretty low. <laughs> and I, it was we weren't loaded with money, and I had to work. And, and immediately, I did do uh, other things, mostly on camera. I don't talk about it very much, but I did do a few westerns with Tim Holt. Do you remember him? Oh, I love Tim Holt. Wasn't they cranked great? out, particularly when he was at either Republic or RKO, they were cranking out those westerns that were almost exactly an hour long. They, they were short little films that they could, if they had a very long first feature, then they would put the, the short, but I thought Tim Holt, was he a nice guy? Oh. He was certainly cute. Oh, he was adorable. Yes. And, of course, I had a huge crush oh, on him. Oh, I bet. Because I had crushes on everybody. <laughs> and I remember him, the first time I saw him in the chronology was in Magnificent Ambersons. Oh, yeah. He yeah. was wonderful. I remember that. He was simply wonderful. But I remember when I was doing a Western with him, and I was very, very shy and very nervous about the camera. That always sort of inhibited me. And they had a lunch break, and I went, you know, and they said, okay, well, I'll go to the lunch room and have lunch and I sat with the crew and I was so self-conscious and so shy and uh, Tim came over and got me and he said you, you're supposed to sit with me now come on back to the <laughs> table where the actors are sitting you don't have to sit with the crew well I can understand that if, if you're used to doing theater that big box oh. that you have to play not only to a wide perspective but to a little round yeah. lens totally different yeah. And I, uh, but I, I was just scared. I was scared of the camera because I didn't feel that I was camera ready. You know, I just didn't feel good in front of the camera. But when I did, uh, when I got the Jetsons, I was working with Tony Franciosa on a show. And they called me on the set of the show and said, you want to audition for an, a cartoon? And I said, a cartoon? Oh, that's like radio. Yeah, yeah I'd yeah. love to do it. <laughs> well, let's jump back, though. You're in Hollywood. Members of your family are moving to L.A. You're not bringing in much income. You get out of that contract with Paramount. What was your first radio gig? Or, or did you do theater and then radio? First thing after the contract was the Westerns. Then I went into radio right after that. And I, I met all of these wonderful people. And for the first time in my young life... I was courageous, and I would walk up to a producer and say, I'd love to work for you in case you have any auditions coming up. And, and of course, I 
totally fascinated with radio. And I think it was because Bing t took my mother and me to his radio show. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. They don't have to wear makeup. <laughs> they, they, you know, they can just talk into the microphone. And so when I um, got first in, into uh, radio, I was, I was brave. Where in pictures, I was so shy that if I would see a producer coming down the hall, I would run into the ladies' room. The neat thing about radio is that although the people, it, it amazes me how the people who were leading actors in the top shows weren't paid hardly anything. Oh, nobody worried about the money. They just wanted the job. Yeah, but, but that when you left the studio, no one recognized you. Oh, that's right. You know, you, you, you could remain completely anonymous oh, at the radio. grocery store. I love radio to this day. I love it. Bob Lee was a director in radio, and uh, I had worked, you know, for all sorts of different directors, and when I met him, I thought, oh, he's young. Everybody else was so old. Now, this is the man who would become your future <laughs> husband. You know, years yes. later. <laughs> yeah. But he had the courage to hire me for dramatic roles, which in radio, I mostly did, you know, little, little, I did... Uh, Meet Carlos Archer. Yeah, well, I want to talk about that, but you, you said to me once one of your favorite roles was in Cyrano de Bergerac. Yes, that was opposite Ronald Coleman. Oh. And let's see, I also... Was there ever a man with a more wonderful voice oh. than Ronald Coleman? Oh, he was a brilliant actor and a dear man. I should explain uh, to those who don't know it, is that Coleman... And this one, it is a far, far better thing. You know, I have oh, this yeah. wonderful very voice. Oh, good, very Thank good. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and his wife was Benita Hume. And yes. And they, they had them on the Jack Benny show once, and they thought it would be a one-shot deal. Well, the interplay between Benny and Coleman, whom they pretend to live next door to Benny, who I think actually lived three houses away or something, uh -huh. was so funny, and, and Jack would imitate Ronald, and he would always call Ronald's wife Benita <laughs> oh, he was <laughs> darling. But he was a good friend of Bob, my mm. husband, who was then in radio, and, and he had him working with him many times. And he was uh, going on a, a cruise, and he said, everybody does their acts, you know. I don't have anything to do. And they, what he did was bird calls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very Thank good. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm kind of known in Palm Springs. I have a friend who plays piano, and he uh, has me do... And oh, I, oh I, that's I wonderful. Me. You know, my There's mother, no place for that anymore. Though. Oh, my mother could do that. My mother was a wonderful wow. whistler as well as a coltura soprano. Well, you know, I can hit the note. I can hit the note square, but I can't do anything fancy. My dad could do what they call flutter tongue. Oh, I'm which, so impressed with oh, that. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's go back to the okay. 40s, and I'll replace Elmo Tanner, one of those wonderful whistlers there. I'll, I'll give you an example on uh, heartaches. Which, which was Ted Weems and Elmo Tanner, I think. It's... But oh, that, that's that, fantastic. You're supposed to go, and I can't do that. Well, listen, you can do enough. Okay. <laughs> you don't that, need that. that. Coming from you, I take that as a compliment. Oh, that's beautiful. So you're... Who knew you had this talent? I sing, too. I oh, you do? Uh, yeah, the last time we were together, we were talking about voices, and I mentioned that almost every radio person has an alter ego. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I, I was uh, working, I think I was 19 or 20, and the salesperson comes into the radio station and says, there's this crazy guy who has started a discount store called Big J's. He said he wants some crazy commercials. Why don't you do the grandmother's voice that Jonathan Winters did? Well, Marty Frickard kind of had a whiny voice, <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. So I asked my dad, I said, do, is there any man in our family who sounds funny? He said, well, how about your grandmother's brother? He had been a Methodist minister, but as he got older, he had uh, kind of phlegm, and oh, phlegm I came know. up. You so, should do voiceover. <laughs> well, I always wanted to. But, but old Bob, you know, it's just that, that, that typical old voice. But what's neat about that is I've done a lot of home videos, and I, I did a one-hour comedy album about a year ago, and Bob plays a part. I am a much better actor as Bob than I am as myself. Really? Yeah, and I hear the characters I do, and I thought, you know, that's really believable. But then when I try to act, I sound kind of wooden. 
Well, you don't need to act because you've got so many things within you oh. that you can do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, 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 the, I remember I needed a name for him. And I was doing, hi there, Bill Greenwood here. And one day, a friend of mine named Bob Whitmore called me. And he would go on to be a, a producer at Warner Brothers. And I got off the phone and I said, Bob Whitmore? And I went, <coughs> well, hi there, oh Bob my Whitmore gosh. here. And that was, my Lord, what, 1970 or something. That, that's fantastic. I had no idea you could do those voices. Well, I didn't come here to, to well, show. Well, I'm so impressed. And, and you do them so naturally. Well, you? and then it, it's just a little, if you want to do a little. These, these are, I call them Jerry Lewis voices. The, the voices that are all up. And he's, 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 it's, a, it's a little tiny. But you're right. You have to take on that persona. Yeah. You have to become that silly little kid to do that voice. I love it. I'm so impressed. I don't have to leave. Who knew? Well, why didn't you do voiceover? Because you're great. I, I, I'm chronically shy. shy <laughs> in, in the, and I think a lot of people, and I shouldn't use the word talent here, but a lot of people with talent are not good promoters. That's why they have to have a manager. Uh -huh. And the persona of a news person is not someone that goes, Hi, uh, Hey, lady! You know, you don't, you don't do that as a news person. <laughs> But oh, anyway, and, you, oh, but I'm so impressed. Oh well, thank you. We'll, we'll do. We'll have to do some, some. The other thing is, I was listening to a Gunsmoke, and it was uh, the great actor John Daner, mm -hmm. another guy I would have loved to have met, was doing an, an old man's voice, and it was that. Head to head, concession. I was always in a kind of like that, you know. Joe Barbera would have loved. And, to. And it, it's almost you have these death rattles come up. <laughs> and, but what's funny is that I can do those and not get a sore throat, but if I talk too much as myself, I do. Oh. Because I never was trained. It, when I sing, for example, I sing. I, I kind of talk down here, yeah. but that's artificial. I sing, awake, up here, because I'm an Irish tenor. But over the years in radio, oh, you've been so I have forced. Let's start a new cartoon studio. Oh, listen. Because I always thought You're my a friend. secret that nobody knows about. I always thought my friend Bob and his. Well, well it's Stu, is, is his name. Together, they would be this old man and this kid who's just on drugs all the time or something, would be a funny cartoon. But I don't think today's kids would sit still for it. Are you kidding? Why not? I don't know. <laughs> there again, I don't have enough faith in myself. Oh, you are good. Were, were you, you did serious acting, but yet your speaking voice, in a way, is kind of like Judy Jetson because you're so energetic. Mm -hmm. Did you have to tone down when, when for example, when your late husband was directing you in serious oh. drama? I can see that they would say, whoop, 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 uh, J -J 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 Judy. Calm down. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the director, I remember on Corliss, even when I was doing Corliss Archer, you know, meet Corliss Archer, he would, uh, in the microphone, he'd do, do this with his hand, you know, moving his hand down because I would go higher and higher and higher, you know. <laughs> and he'd say, no, lower, lower, lower. Uh, I, I had to keep myself in check in radio because, but Ozzie Nelson, with whom I did uh, Ozzie and Harriet, and I did Emmy Lou, a little teenager, Next door. And how old would you have been at that time? Uh, I was probably about... Okay, so you were kind of the right 19, age to do yeah. the character. Oh, yeah, because I was trying to get into radio, and I was playing all sorts of dramatic roles. And and ingenues. And, yeah. and, and then I could just be myself. And so How did I, that happen then? If Cor Corliss Archer was the, almost at the time, the quintessential bubbly high school girl, kind of like a, a grown-up baby Snooks in a way, you know, who was... Who was <laughs> Always, there's that wonderful episode where your dad has a headache. And uh, you may not, because you did some many I of them. remember. But your mother it. keeps saying, quiet, and then you try to be quiet. And they said, but daddy. I, yeah, <laughs> I remember just, that. Yeah. Fred Shields was the father of that. He was wonderful. Irene Tedrow was a wonderful actress. She was the mother, and she was also a, a theater person. That was the wonderful thing about radio. Most of the people in radio at that time were from the theater. She was a Shakespearean actress. And you know something wonderful? The people at radio were all actors. I mean, real actors from theater, which was, was so why they were so great, because they were studied, controlled, experienced actors. And the one thing I've learned through research that just blew me away was how little rehearsal you had. None. I mean, we had one read-through. Read You'd sit at a, a table 
with the director we'd and just do a read through? We'd read around once, you know, read the script cold, and then one uh, reading on the mic, and then the air. And the mic was basically for the engineers, I would suppose, to yeah. do the levels yeah, and, exactly. and everything. I, I remember Harry Bartell, who yes. was in everything in radio, telling me that they did that with gun smoke, that sometimes that if they had problems, they would actually do a couple of gun smokes with no rehearsal, that the director would simply say, this is the plot, you're a minister, you got a slight German accent, this is the way we're going to go with this. Of course, that was on tape, so they could fix it. Oh, but this was before tape. Yeah. And that when did Corliss Archer start? 1945, I think. Yeah, before tape. Yeah. Do you remember the first show, what opening night was like, live audience, I presume? Oh, absolutely. Knowing that you had to get off on time? I mean, unlike a play, that if it runs long, it's oh. okay. Oh, but with well, radio, there's a guy with a stopwatch there. Well, they would come to the microphone, you know, because it was all live, and you would have your script, and would, when they were running long, they would come and make big X's and, you know, an arrow where you had to skip and go to where the, you know, because they had to cut places on the air. Mm. And I did that with Bob Hope. I, I did a, a little girl selling cookies. Would you do that for us? I, you, I remember you telling me about that. You're trying to get him to buy Girl Scout cookies, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I, you know, uh, Mr. Hope, these are wonderful cookies, and I know you're just going to love them. And, and, and Bob Hope was so funny that he got so many laughs on that show that they had to cut almost everything. <laughs> so how did you find out about this CBS network radio show called Meet Cordless Archer? Did you have to audition heavily for it? I just did one audition, but the, I was doing little bits in other radio shows. Radio was clouded with good actors, and but I was enamored of radio, and so I did, to begin with, they would hire me because I had learned from being in pictures how to dress, you know, so that you would call attention to yourself. <laughs> so uh, they would have me do what they called in those days Walla Walla. Walla Walla. Walla Walla. Have anything to do with Walla Walla, Washington? Uh, well, I, I, you know about Walla Walla, Washington. Good for you. But uh, they, they called it Walla Walla because, in other words, you just did sort of uh, background voices saying, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, in other words, if there's a so crowd, crowd scene, crowd noise, yeah. uh, for example, a barroom scene in Gunsmoke, the people yeah. who aren't on mic are, are just are kind of mumbling. Walla Walla. And they called oh, that Walla Walla. 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 And, and <laughs> so they hired me first, and then they would call me to audition for a few things. I'm trying to think of what the very first radio show. I did, I did a radio show which was about a family, and I was the daughter, and somebody heard me doing that, and that's why I got the audition for, for Meet Carlos Archer. F. Hugh Herbert was the author. And he had written a uh, play called Kiss and Tell. Do you remember anything about that? A jo little bit. Joan Caulfield at the time was a very well-known actress, and she was doing it on Broadway. And he decided to make a radio show of it. So he, he heard me doing that show, and he asked my you know ask somebody to have me come and audition and I was so nervous I remember I dropped the script all over the floor <laughs> but they hired me right away and he was very very particular that I would be dressed as a you know I would wear what I would normally wear you know just crummy shoes and <laughs> and and you know look like a teenager and of course absolutely no makeup we we none of sure. us and uh, Irene Tedra was a mother, Fred Shields was a father, and dear Sammy Edwards was mm -hmm. the greatest Dexter Franklin. And he... Uh, he would yell, Corliss! I remember. That's right. Yeah. And he, he had such sweetness about him that he would just break your heart, you know, because Corliss was so mean to him. You know? It was so interesting to hear Sammy get older. And he evolved. Of course, Richard Crenna, your late oh, next door neighbor, yeah. was playing kids in his fifties. You know. Yeah, I know. Well, Dick and I, we worked together a lot. As well, I've told you about the Lucy show that we mm -hmm. did together. It was a very dear man and a wonderful actor. But doing teenagers was just great fun. Well, as you say, it let you be yourself. That's you, right. There was no lid on. There was some lid, but but you your your ebullient personality you played just into yourself. that character. Exactly, yeah. because that's why it was fun for me, because most of the acting that I did was something very apart from me. Yeah, if you're playing Desdemona or someone, yeah. you, you just you have to be into that character. And uh, I... I i got to tell you, I loved radio, though, because you could do anything you could sound like. The other thing you talked about, which I've heard from so many other radio people, 
is there was such a sense of camaraderie. If you didn't get the part, you wanted somebody oh, else to get it. Oh, absolutely. You There was nothing, your best vi- friend. no backbiting, no, nothing vicious oh, no. in that radio fraternity. No, it was totally, perfectly wonderful and different from today. It was, it, everybody loved everybody. I, to this day, anybody mentions a radio actor and I want to see him. I want to, you know, I, I love radio. Janet Waldo, you were Corliss Archer, the, the quintessential bubbly teenager on very successful CBS radio show. Transitioning into the 50s came television. And a lot of people know you from your association with Lucille Ball. Tell us about that. <laughs> Well, she was a wonderful lady, and I loved working with her and with Desi. And uh, I, I did, worked with Dick Crenna on that show. And it was uh, a couple of teenagers who were, who were in love with Lucy and Desi. I was in love with Desi, and, and Dick Crenna was in love with Lucy. And so in order to get rid of us, they aged themselves. Oh. And actually, then the, the, uh, Lucy wheeled Desi in in a wheelchair, and, you know, and I was the teenager waiting to see my hero and everything, and he was in a wheelchair. And I said, but, oh, you're so old. And then he, she said, well, he has pain in his knees. And he says, yeah, Peggy, jiggle, jiggle my knees. And so uh, I, I would jiggle his knees. And that They play it still. Keep jiggling, Peggy, keep jiggling. And, you know, people now when I go to sign autographs, they'll say, keep, they say, keep jiggling, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> but that was fun. I really enjoyed it. I had worked with Dick in radio, but he was wonderful in that show. And he and I did many appearances, uh, personal appearances, from as a result of having done that jo- show together. I just think the luckiest break Dick Crenna ever got was being chosen to work with Walter Brennan on The Real McCoys. Oh, that because that's the- how I first learned of Dick really? Crenna, was seeing him... He Rio was a McCoy's. wonderful actor, you know. He could do. He looked anything. as if he was not acting. That's the way he was. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that he was just en- enjoyed what he was doing. I I just loved him. I, what, I just, what was it like when he died in the in the Hollywood community? I, I take it he was very well liked. He was beloved, and he was my neighbor. Mm-hmm. I think I told you that. And his daughter called me and told me. I, I could not accept that. I couldn't. I had no idea that he was that dangerously ill. And I, I, just, I just was overwhelmed with grief about that. Even though people like to talk about her cartoon work, I knew that she enjoyed talking about her real first love, radio. The thing that I sense about radio is that before television... It was, of course, in many ways, bigger than TV is now, because TV is so segmented, half of it's on the Internet, it's HBO, it's this. The city of Los Angeles must have been a beehive of activity in radio. People must have been running from studio to studio. Oh, gosh, running from studio to studio. In radio days, you know, actors were so busy and doing more than one show a day, and in order to make the other show, they would have to take a cab uh, uh, to from one studio to another in order to get there on time, because it was all live radio. You know, mm. there was no tape in those, in those years. I, I think today's performers who have products, whether it be a TV show or a record, where they spend hundreds of hours fixing it later, when you had to do it live, you had to be good at it. Oh, and you know, I miss those live days, because there were a lot of things that happened that were a little bit bad, you know, that were mistakes, but they were what made it real. And it was, you know, we'd always, radio people would always make something of the of What the was the one about Whoopi? Oh, I think what you're talking about is uh, a, a show that my husband wrote uh, with, that I did with Jimmy Lydon. And uh, B. Benadaret was playing an old Western lady on it. And it was about kids in college. Young Love, it was called. And uh, she had to come into the dean's office and had to say, Yippee! And he'd say, don't yippee in my office, and, and, but on the air, and it was live, she said, yippee, and he said, don't yippee in my office. <laughs> and, you know, the audience started laughing, and the actors had no idea why they were laughing. They hadn't, they hadn't heard it. We had it. never yeah, heard it yeah. that way. We had heard it at rehearsal, but, sure. you know, and nobody had said, made that mistake. And, and and they laugh for two minutes. The other thing that is interesting about radio with an audience, and today people would have a difficult time understanding why there would be people standing at microphones reading a script. 
is that when a recognizable actor such as Mel Blanc or Frank Nelson would head toward the mic, the audience would kind of titter because they knew what was coming. That's right. Yeah. They knew they knew all the radio actors and they knew their shtick. Mm-hmm, you know, they, mm-hmm, they knew mm-hmm. what to expect from them. And, uh, oh gosh, they were so good. And it was such fun. I, I loved live radio because I remember looking at the clock and seeing, you know, when they say, okay, guys, two minutes to airtime, you know, and then you'd watch, and it would seem like two hours, mm-hmm. you know, and you think, and then boom, there you were on the air. But, you know, isn't this interesting? Because my whole career in the last several years has been cartoons. But, Everybody I talk to wants to talk about radio, and so do I, because it was a perfectly wonderful era. Your husband was Robert E. Lee, the writer. That's right. Remind us, of, in addition to all the things in radio, what he's remembered for? Inherit the Wind, which is the main thing he's remembered. That was their first, He Lawrence and Lee, they were called, and they were from, oh, both of them were from Ohio, and they met in radio, and they worked together for years, and were fantastic writers. And uh, stop me if I've told you before, I, uh, they, they created quite a sensation in Hollywood. But um, he, he was a brilliant writer, and they wrote about Inherit the Wind because it was during the war and uh, when they were writing it, and they were very agonized by the fact that People were fired from their jobs, and I remember on Ozzie and Harriet, he had to fire somebody, you know, because they thought that they were... A communist? A communist. Yeah. And, Bad uh, times. And so Inherit the Wind was sort of a declaration of independence of, of the human person. And um, uh, they were just wonderful writers, and Inherit the Wind had a terrible time getting on Broadway, um, because they showed it to, uh, I think, six or seven different producers, and they all turned it down. And then their agent, they, the, the first production of it was done in Dallas by Margot Jones in one of her little theaters, and she wanted to do it. And their own agent said, oh, you can't do that in Dallas. I mean, it'll never work in Dallas. Margot Jones discovered it. And once it was put on in Dallas with Paul Muni as the lead, uh, it caused a, a, a riot. It, I mean, it caused a really big reaction, and everybody in New York wanted it, and it was produced on Broadway, and it was a big hit. And the opening night, my favorite opening night in my life, was when they did Inherit the Wind. I was in the audience, and the people cried, Author! Author! <laughs> and I just thought, I've lived now. <laughs> this was the most wonderful thing. I, I often wondered whether Agnes Moorhead on Bewitched realized that when she would often refer to her son-in-law, Dick York, as Darwin instead of Darren, oh. she would sometimes call him Darwin, that he had played the the Scopes character in Inherit the Wind. Really? Who, of course, was teaching Darwin to the students. I you didn't know, know yeah, that. And I thought, I wonder if that was just a funny coincidence or if she had come up with that. I bet she came up. Knowing Agnes Moorhead, she well, probably Well, knowing did. Agnes Moorhead, I, I worked with her a lot. I just thought she was wonderful. And she gave me a lot of advice as a very young girl, you know, such as, why are you covering yourself up with your dresses there? You know, why? Why don't you let your arm, why don't you let something show? <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, uh, worked together a lot. And I do know that she was doing a radio show in New York when she got a call to come to California to work with Orson Welles, and she made them promise that when she finished the movie, they'd give her her job back in New York, and of course, she never went back. Never went back, no. But, I mean, she was so scared and insecure. I tell this story a lot, but I think the most incredible one word ever spoken in movies is in Citizen Kane. She's playing Kane's mother. The boy is outside with his sled. The Philadelphia lawyer has come to get the boy to take him east because he's going to be one of the richest people in the world. Agnes Moorhead, as the mother, has these last-minute thoughts on her face. Am I doing the right thing? Will I ever see my son again? And she opens the window, the camera cuts to the outside, and she says, Charles! And the way she says that, she's saying, is this goodbye? Will I see you again? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah, I mean, I'm almost crying now, but that one word, and you see her face agonizing over calling his name. Oh, she was... 
oh, a dream actress. She was a wonderful actress, and I was so thrilled that in that time of my life, I got to work with and know these fantastic performers. Remember Ed Bakley? Oh. Remember uh, uh, the wonderful people that we got to work with? They were all magnificent. And they were nice people, I understand. And aren't you interested that we're talking mostly about radio? Yes. When, when Everybody you know, wants to talk to you about Judy Jetson. Yeah, yeah, that's all they're interested in. In fact, when I first won the part of Judy Jetson and went to the first rehearsal, I never told anybody there about my radio background. And I never told them ever, none of the other cast members, because I thought they wouldn't even remember radio. Let's spend a minute okay. on Judy Jetson. What was the actor like who played George Jetson? What an unusual voice he had. Oh, he was a wonderful actor. He had his own show for a while, and in fact, I have copies of it, which I have, I'm ashamed to say, not listened to, but I knew everything that he had done. But he was not interested in doing voices. He only did George Jetson. And he was fantastic. And, you know, Joe Barbera auditioned a lot of people for that and, in fact, even hired one man to play the father uh, in the Jetsons. And then he decided, on, you know, he wanted to go with uh, George O'Hanlon. Was O'Hanlon pretty well then using his own voice? Oh, he was fantastic, but that's the only thing he would do was George O'Hanlon. That one character, yeah. That one character. As and, pretty much himself. And Penny Singleton did the same thing. She only did Penny, mm -hmm. you know, as, as Jane Jetson. And, of course, I was crazy. I wanted to do, oh, I want to do some other voices. And I said, Mr. Barbera, uh, uh, I, could I? He said, make me a tape. And my husband wrote a lot of dialogue for me, and I did all sorts of crazy voices that Bob helped me create. And then I sent the tape, and I got the mother-in-law and the Flintstones <laughs> because I wanted to do far-out voices. You know, I was used to doing my own Well, it's, it's like the characters I do. I, I've always thought, even though I'm kind of proud of them, they're not quiet. I mean, they're not the kind of voices you want to do in a library. That's right. <laughs> and and most, That's of a wonderful the, expression. most of the really exciting cartoon voices, they're still acting, but it's over the top. You know, but they have to be because they're bigger than life in a lot of ways. That's the, the cartoon is upbeat. I mean, how many sad cartoons have you seen? Oh, yeah. And the thing we forget today, this wasn't a Saturday show. The, the Flintstones, these, these were primetime television shows. That's right. That's right. Hanna-Barbera, I think the Jetsons was one of their favorite babies. They really loved the Jetsons and were very protective of it. And you know, it was on for a long, long time. Now, when you did those, unlike today, where they will bring in an actress and just record her part, and then bring in an actor and just record his part, you had interplay of course. as if it were still radio. It was so much better, because now I've done commercials as Judy Jetson, and I go in there and I have the microphone, and it's just me. We work together, and the fun part of it was that when I first went there, I, you know, all the actors were going around, they, they didn't know what they were playing until they got to rehearsal, and then they were looking at the script, and they would take it off in a corner and mumble, 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 you know, <laughs> you know try, practicing all of their different voices, and then it was like in a symphony orchestra where the, all of the uh, or, all of the people are to tuning up uh, it, it must have been as they use the word rush now meaning the adrenaline feeling the first time the ensemble for the jetsons got together and the rehearsals were over and it clicked and you each realized what these characters were it must have felt wonderful. It felt so great. And I remember I was terrified when I got called to do the Jetsons. I thought, oh, my gosh, wh what are they going to ask me to do? And I was so scared. But Joe Barbera directed the first 24 episodes, and he used to take six hours to direct it. Six hours. To do to a do half a hour, half which hour isn't radio. even a half hour. It's about 20 minutes. Yeah. He knew exactly what he wanted. He was a wonderful director. I remember Dawes Butler, you know, uh, well, everybody loved Doss Butler. What a sweetheart of a guy. But but Joe would pick on him. He he wouldn't let anybody get, you know, he'd say, no, 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 and I, you know, that isn't right. Now, come on, what else have you got? And Joe was just very, very particular, and he wouldn't let you get, get away with anything until he heard what he wanted to hear. Now, when you were called to do the character in the Flintstones, you worked with B. Benadera. Yes. And you worked with Alan Reed Sr., Yes. Now, the interesting thing is, if you go back in radio, Alan Reed Sr. played a character named Pasquale on a show called Life with Luigi. He would play uncles, you know, and I would listen to these shows, and then because 
I heard Flintstone first. I'm thinking, why is Fred Flintstone playing somebody's <laughs> uncle, right? But oh, I have heard that funny. Alan Reed was just this big, frumpy ball of energy. Oh, he was. And, you know, he played many, many parts on uh, the Jets. A uh, talking watch one time, you know. He would, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, Don Messick, who was also a... And, uh, and Dawes Butler, of course, were fantastic actors. But I remember the last show we did for the Jetsons, uh, Joe said, uh, Don, you're going to do the camel. And Don said to me, I have no idea what a camel sounds like. But he came up with something that was right on the nose. Th- and- this sounds like the tapes I've heard of, of the great... I bow to him, Paul Fries. Oh, I loved him. And June Foray, and I bow to William Conrad in taping Rocky and Bullwinkle. Yeah. Because Jay Ward, who did that, would say, okay, uh, Paul, sound like a, a sewing machine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or something. yeah. And, yeah. They, and they would come up with something. Amazing. But, you know, I didn't realize it until uh, Don Messick told me, but he had been a ventriloquist. No. Before he was an actor. Yeah. Well, Don had that great, I mean, he, so many like uh, of the little characters he did in, in the, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons and Quick Draw McGraw and everything. Yeah. You can kind of hear that down. Yeah. You know. Oh, he was great. It was such a privilege to work with those really brilliant people. And, of course, I loved them all. And uh, I just, I just love doing the Jetsons. You have on your wall some great pictures of the characters you played. Let's close out by going across the wall. Remind us of some of these people. And I'm funny. I said people. Well, but, that's good. Yeah, I'm it glad. is, isn't it? Yes. Well, down But you there, brought life to them. Oh, I, I loved it. I loved it. And the wonderful man who did these cartoons for me is a marvelous cartoonist, Arash Piron, and he uh, gave them all to me. And you know what? I got Joe and Bill to sign them, but I forgot to sign them myself. <laughs> but anyway, down there is the mother-in-law and the Flintstones. And then that is Josie and Josie and the Pussycats. And then the first part I got, other than Judy, was a little old lady. Uh, and Joe auditioned me for that. Uh, and he said, do you think you can play little old lady? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, okay, come to the session. And that was Grandma, Granny Sweet. And then, of course, Judy Jetson was the per- uh, part that I got to begin with. Was there ever a perkier character than that cross between Corliss Archer and Judy Jetson in the history of radio and cartoons? <laughs> I, I don't, don't know. think so. Well, I don't know. I, <laughs> and you still sound like that. Oh, well, I, I, love, I love doing voices, but I love, that's the closest to my own voice. Except, yes. Uh, except a little higher. There's more seven up no, in you know, I, just, I just do me, except I'm more excited. And I do it, you know, like up here. But anyway, that was Judy Jetson. And then this one was a tough part for me. Joe asked me to come and audition for it. Morticia in the Adams family. You know, Thing has knitted us a bat swing. And I got it. I, I think I was very good at it. And then Penelope Pitstop. Oh, I love doing Penelope Pitstop. She was one of my favorites. And, um, oh, you know oh, who, who would have played that character if you didn't, if she had been doing radio? You're going to say? Shirley Mitchell. Shirley Mitchell. Well, when I did radio, uh, Young Love, and, and she stole the show because she did her old you know, character, her Southern Belle. Oh, you are Absolutely. And she was trying to romance Gildersleeve for yeah, a thousand years, yeah. you know? Oh, she was great. That's it, pretty much. It, Josie, in Josie and the Pussycats, had a huge fan base. Three shows that are now very, very popular, and when I do autographs, they always want to know about Judy, about Penelope, and about Josie and the Pussycats. And Josie and the Pussycats played for a long, long time. It had Casey Kasem. They want us to do autographs all the time and, and send pictures of Josie and the Pussycats. And uh, so I, it's, it's, I love fans, by the way. Janet, let me wrap up by having you talk about something we did in the last interview, and that is the fact that you think of yourself as being an actress. In your psyche, the fact that this is, this is cute, it's funny, millions of people watched, but you were acting and you were doing something that you wanted to do. Talk about that. Well, I, I grew up wanting to be an actress uh, because I like to be someone other than myself. And I thought, you know, I could sort of hide in that acting role. And in high school, I remember I would do things like Joan of Arc and uh, Queens, you know, and marvelously dramatic roles. And uh, 
uh, when I was doing uh, Beth and Little Women, I uh, it was unusual because I, I did many far-out characters, you know, that were very, very unlike me. And I think wanting to be an actress is because you want to be somebody else because you're sort of scared of yourself, you know. <laughs> you just want to be somebody else. I, is that, does that answer your question? I'm not sure. No, very much so, yeah. For example, my Bob Whitmore character I do, I don't cuss a lot. Now, <laughs> I can do that as Bob, but you can't do but it. But I as don't yourself. do it as myself. Yeah, yeah, this is the trick. I mean, this is the thing. You, by being an actor, you can be somebody else, and that's why I wanted to go to Broadway. I wanted because I never really knew me, but I knew all of these characters I played. You know, I somehow well, fell in love with them. Well, you should have the satisfaction of knowing that there are damn few people in Hollywood in entertainment who have done as many things as you have. I'm very grateful. I really don't know how I've been so fortunate. And I also had very good things to do in film. I mean, working with Tony Franciosa was quite a wonderful experience. And uh, I worked with many fantastic people in films. And uh, But uh, film scared me. I was, I was always afraid of the camera. The camera was, as far as I was concerned, the enemy. And that's why I love cartoons and radio. Is there any way we could ad-lib something where my character's talking to Corliss or something? I can't think of a scenario. You, could, by the way, you are great. I would like a tape of all Oh, of I'll get characters. you. Oh, okay. You? Well, I also, I'll send you a CD. I did a comedy album uh, about a couple of years ago. It's kind of inside because it's based on radio news. It uses all my characters, and I did something You're I wonderful. wanted. Thank I, you. I, I wanted to do. You know what do. I would do if if Joe were here, if Joe Barbera were here? He would love to hear your well, characters. Well, thank you. And, and, I mean, you would be put to work immediately. But this is the way I, I stay fun with myself. When I'm around the house, I'm Bob a lot, you know, and it just and I don't like to think I have a split personality, but I think if you do voices like that, you have to. But, you know, the, the thing that, that is so much fun is all my friends always said, Dennis, you should have done radio. But what I was saying is that I tried in the album to do something they don't do in cartoons anymore. When a character moves over here like this, he's got to go off mic a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they use these $3,000 microphones, and they're all up like this. And even though they're dancing around as their character, they back up four or five feet. They're always right up oh. here. They should be back here the way they did oh, it in the radio. But listen, you remember Howie Morris, don't you? Oh, yeah. Because he was the first one on the first session I did for Hanna-Barbera. And I realized, because I had been working in radio where you were very strict, you stayed in line with the microphone and everything. Howie Morris, would he did Jet Screamer on the Jetsons. And he was going, Whoa, hooray, oh, baby, baby, baby. And he was moving his arms around and moving all around. And, and Joe loved it. Everybody loved it. You could do that. You could do that in, in cartoons. You could but move they around. don't now. Cartoons are so... I know. They're but isn't, isn't, isn't there a temptation when you get older to say everything new is bad? <laughs> I suppose, but... But I don't think that's entirely untrue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is fun. Would you rather oh. be Judy Jetson or Corliss Archer? Judy is the most tempor most contemporary. Okay. I would rather be Judy Jetson. Now, uh, I understand here that you're applying for a job as a typist. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yes. I, I, I am a typist. I can type. Uh, how many words a minute? Uh, oh, well, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty fast. For example, if I gave you a, a, a dictation, could you, could you do that? Uh, well, if you don't talk too fast. Could we have the next person here, please? Oh, you mean I'm not going to get the job? Well, this is a difficult job. I mean, you can't just have education on a matchbook. You have oh. to be able to do something. Oh, well, you're hard. Do, do you for. drive trucks, or is there anything else you might want to do in this company? You know something? What's that? I've never wanted to be a truck driver. Well, let's go outside. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> oh, you're fun. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Janet, this has been a wonderful hour. And, I and loved it. I loved it. I feel much better now at the end than I did at the beginning. Well, good, good. And thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. No matter how many times you saw someone or interviewed them, it's still sad when you find out they're gone. Janet Waldo, Judy Jetson, 
a star of radio, Penelope Pitstop, and just a really nice lady, was 96. I'm Dennis Daly.